the Gilda's maximum lawyers community of legal entrepreneurs who are taking their businesses and lives to the next level. As a Guild member, you'll build relationships, be held accountable, and learn strategies specifically designed to get you unstuck and accelerate your plan for growth. Members are also granted exclusive access to masterminds hosted around the country. Our next event is coming up, and we're heading to Scottsdale, Arizona. There's something truly magical about the power of these in-person connections where real-time breakthroughs happen. Picture this. You're surrounded by like-minded law firm owners tackling your business and mindset challenges together. The energy is electric, the insights are transformative, and the results are game-changing. Investing in yourself is the best decision you'll ever make. The knowledge, strategies, and breakthroughs you'll gain are priceless assets that will supercharge your practice and propel you forward. Join the Guild and secure your ticket to Scottsdale at the best possible price by visiting maxlawevents.com. I think there are a lot of things we ought to be doing in terms of our marketing, but we also need to have some criteria for rejecting those ideas. For some of us, we see shiny objects and when we get distracted and everything seems like it would be a good idea and we have a hard time focusing. And so I'm trying to help people out by talking about this topic. I'm trying to help them to separate the wheat from the chaff and pick the things that really make sense from a marketing standpoint. Run your law firm the right way. The right way. This is the Maximum Lawyer Podcast. Maximum Lawyer Podcast. Your hosts, Jim Hacking and Tyson Mutrix. Let's partner up and maximize your firm. Welcome to the show. Welcome back to the Maximum Lawyer Podcast. I'm your host, Jim Hacking. And I'm Tyson Mutrix. Jimmy, we've got an awesome guest today, Lee Rosen. I think you and I are both really excited about him coming on today. Lee, thanks for joining us. I appreciate you inviting me. Can you tell our listeners a little bit about yourself and your practice? Sure, I can do that. I started my firm in 1990. I'm old. I got out of law school back in uh, 87, went to Wake Forest University in North Carolina and built my practice there. We do family law and we have four offices and about a dozen lawyers all doing family law. And I did that for a long time and then started blogging. And uh, that's how you guys stumbled across me. I started a blog called Divorce Discourse probably seven or eight years ago and started writing about law practice, marketing and management, technology, finance, that sort of thing for small firm lawyers. Lee, I'm curious about the Divorce Discourse part because we're going to get to our topic in a second. But when did you really realize that the DivorceDiscourse.com started to really take off? You know, I mean, it's always gotten a lot of feedback for me. I've never paid much attention to the statistics. I pay a lot of attention to the law firm. I've always felt like, you know, that was my primary activity was running the law firm and practicing law. And Divorce Discourse was really sort of a side project to um, to help others. You know, I really felt like it was one of those things where I, I knew a little bit about this and I could help lawyers that were coming along. And at some point, it became clear that a lot of folks were reading it, and the ABA started giving it their awards for you know the blog 100, and every year we would win our category in the popular vote. So it was sort of hard to ignore, and I got more and more interested in, in that whole arena of what I was working on and built out a sort of a membership site, and I started doing workshops for lawyers and have been doing all of that for, I guess, three or four years. So it has turned into kind of a side business that actually generates income at this point. And it's it's really a lot of fun. I mean, in a lot of ways, it's a real diversion from practicing law. Lee, tell us a little bit about those workshops. Our mutual friend, Tyson, and my mutual friend, Steve Bartle, went to one of yours. I think it was in Chicago about two years ago, and he, he spoke very highly of it. Can you tell our listeners sort of what you do at those workshops? Well, I don't do them very often. I do them, I've done them probably 20 times around the world, and I'm not spending much time in the United States anymore. And so I, I'm doing them periodically. But it's a really intense day with 10 lawyers, and we brainstorm and share ideas and talk about marketing and management and technology. And I have always taken sort of a radically different approach to doing a lot of these things, and I pass that along in the workshops. 
So for some folks, it really is kind of a perspective-changing experience. They begin to see their practices very differently than they had before. And so in that way, it's kind of an exciting day. All right, Lee, I think we could probably ask you questions all day, but let's get into the topic of the day. It's 12 reasons to pass on a marketing tactic. You just want to tell us just generally what the topic is about and then go right into number one? Yeah, you know, we are all presented with all these opportunities to do marketing in one way or another. And sometimes those opportunities are presented in the form of a, you know, a phone call from some vendor trying to sell us something or Sometimes we're talking to another lawyer who's telling us, oh, I'm having great results with this or with that. Or um, often we just see somebody down the street doing something and we think, well, it must be working for them. We ought to do it. And I think there are a lot of things we ought to be doing in terms of our marketing. But we also need to have some criteria for rejecting those ideas. For some of us, we see shiny objects and when we get distracted and everything seems like it would be a good idea and we have a hard time focusing. And so I'm trying to help people out by talking about this topic. I'm trying to help them to separate the wheat from the chaff and pick the things that really make sense from a marketing standpoint. And so the first rule that I really like to help people with on this is I said, look, Sometimes you're already doing enough and the things that you are doing have lots of potential to grow and you need to go deeper, not broader. So, you know, I'll meet a lawyer that's doing great with networking, but they still have free time. And the last thing they need to do is go learn how to do pay-per-click advertising from Google. They need to stick with what they're good at and what's working. And so my first thought on passing on a marketing topic or tactic is, hey, you're already doing plenty. Just keep going with that. Don't add something new to the mix right now. I think that's phenomenal. Tyson was probably giggling when you were talking about people who have shiny object syndrome because I find myself struggling with that all the time. But the go deeper, I think that's right. I think that too many people try to do too many things at once instead of just focusing on whatever's working for them or whatever feels right for their personality. Yeah, I think it ought to be sort of a guiding principle for all of us. The other thing that comes up a lot, and we all bump into this is you ought to pass on a tactic if you don't understand it. And that happens to all of us a lot. We get these pitches from vendors and I analogize it to my experience with the financial gurus. They always say, don't invest if you don't understand the investment. So there are a million investments, you know, I pass on. I don't invest in stock futures or options or you know, Forex currency trading, or I mean, I don't understand any of that stuff. So I pass on it. And that advice is good advice when it comes to marketing. When you get somebody on the phone trying to pitch you on search engine optimization, or they want to do remarketing, or, you know, they're baffling you with baloney about Facebook lookalike audiences. If you're willing to invest the time to understand it, then maybe it makes sense. But if you don't get it, and you're not going to figure it out, Stay away. Do not put money on the line for things you don't understand. That's really interesting, Lee, that you said that because I had a call just the other day, I think it was last week, from one of the usual suspects, and I was asking them how it worked, and I couldn't figure it out, and they couldn't explain it. And so I was just getting so frustrated. And I had actually talked to another attorney that uh, Jim and I know, Chris Finney, and he had the exact same conversation with the exact same company. And you're right. If they can't explain it, if you can't understand it, just pass on it. So many of us just listen to those pitches and think, well, it it sounds good. We don't understand it, but we'll throw money at it and see what happens. And it's just a bad idea. The other biggie in this arena is a marketing tactic that we, when something comes up that you just know in your gut, you hear about it and you think, yeah, we should do this, but you don't want to do it. The best example is launching a program in your firm for networking. Some of us love to go to lunch. You know, we love meeting new people. We love to go to events. We're excited by that. And others of us just want to curl up in a fetal position under the conference room table and pretend it's not happening. And if that's the way you feel about a tactic, this is not the tactic for you. You ought to be excited and energized about whatever marketing idea it is that you are considering. Just skip on those things. Don't do them. If you're not excited about it, you don't want to do it, don't do it. There are plenty of things you can do. I think that's a great mindset. You know, I really enjoy shooting YouTube videos and I've gotten a lot of pleasure out of making those and having the interactions afterwards where I'm just sort of explaining immigration law concepts to people. 
And that's something I enjoy. And going out and networking is not necessarily something that I enjoy. And so diving into the things that we really like or that fit our personality, I think that's brilliant. Right. Have some fun with this. You know, don't get bogged down in things that make you miserable. Now, one way we get bogged down in this, and this leads me into this next little bit of advice here, is don't do the marketing tactic because somebody else is doing it. And I see this constantly where the lawyer down the street is doing something. It could be, you know, something crazy like wrapping your car in, you know, your firm name or, uh, you know, I mean, you see, we all see other law firms doing these things and we get sucked in. If the competition is doing it, we ought to be doing it. There are so many ways to build your practice. You don't need to jump on the bandwagon just because one of your competitors is doing it. I think we get jealous. We get distracted by knowing they're doing it, and we feel like, oh, we're out. That's not a good reason. Pick your own tactic. Pick the one that works for you. Don't bother with copying the other people. That's another bad idea. You want to stay away from those tactics. I think it's a Mark Twain quote where he says, if you see everyone doing one thing, do something else. It's the same thing with lawyer advertising. In like lawyer advertising, Ben Glass talks about this quite a bit where if all the attorneys are doing one thing, you may want to do something else because you're just going to be going in with the crowd and there's more competition. So I think that's great advice, Lee. We have a friend who opened up his own law firm and he he jumped on a billboard. He got a a huge billboard. I think it cost him $20,000 and he didn't get one case out of it. So I think your point is well taken. Well, and that really leads me to another tip on this. And that is don't do things that don't work. Now that seems self-evident, right? Obviously, you don't want to do things that don't work. But the bottom line is we don't always know if they work or not. And These marketing companies, I think one of the ways we believe we can discern a good plan from a bad plan or a good tactic from a bad tactic is um, if the marketing company has been around for a while. A good example of that is these companies that do what they refer to as matching, legal matching, wink, wink. Some of these companies have been around for a long time, and I've not met many lawyers who've had good luck with these things. If you're being pitched on a tactic, and there's no evidence that it works, don't believe it works just because this company is still pitching it to you or has been pitching it for a long time. Make sure you get references from these vendors and talk to real life other lawyers that are having success with these tactics. A whole bunch of this stuff is just garbage and it's a waste of your time and your money and it doesn't work. Don't buy it unless the vendor can prove to you that it actually works. Lee, I know what company you're talking about, and Jimmy will appreciate this because that company has a great nine-word email that they send out. And I don't know if you've gotten the email, Lee, but I've gotten it where they say, we tried to call your office. Are you still looking for marketing tactics or something like that? They've they've got a bunch of good ones where it says, I thought you were interested in such and such services. They're really good about sending these emails to really get you to try to respond to them. And I know what company you're talking about, and I've never used them. I've never heard anybody (laughs) that, that uses them either. Well, and you make a point, and that leads me right into this next reason to pass on a marketing tactic, and that is you don't trust the vendor, and it is so obvious when some of these folks call or contact you. They just stink. They give off a really bad vibe. They have a bad smell. You need to trust your instincts when you feel that way, and if you've been practicing law for 20 minutes – You've gotten calls from people trying to sell you leads or search engine optimization or local advertising, and they just reek. I mean, you can literally smell it through the phone. If you don't have a a sense of trust, stay away from these people. Yeah, Lee, you said earlier that you were old. I'm old, too. And when I started my practice, it was the Yellow Pages. The, The Yellow Pages salesperson would come call in. And they would tell you, you know, you got to have a quarter page ad or a trunk ad or, you know, a two page ad. And they were just trying, you know, their incentive is not to get you calls. Their incentive is to sell as much ad space in the medium that they can. So I think that young attorneys, new attorneys really get taken advantage of. They really do. And when you signed up for those yellow pages, you were making a minimum of a 12 month commitment. And I think that's another big red flag and a reason to pass on a marketing tactic, and that is when they want a commitment. There is no reason in the world we live in today to sign a one-year or a two-year or a three-year deal like a lot of these vendors try to suck you into. The reality today is that the things that work the best for us involve no commitment. 
if you want to advertise and you go to Google AdWords, you can commit for 10 seconds. You know, you you can walk away 10 seconds after you start. And if you want to build a professional network and you change your mind, well, again, there's no contract. You decide to stop doing that, you can stop. The very effective ways to build your network or your practice today do not involve signing a deal. And I feel like these vendors who want you to sign on for the long haul, they do that because they know you're going to want out. And boy, you can find articles all over the web on, you know, strategies for getting out of these contracts with these vendors, but it's tough. I know people that have gone to court to litigate trying to get out of their contracts with marketing vendors. Today, there's just no reason to sign on for any sort of commitment. You don't need to do it. Yeah, I've been to court in the county and I've seen when the Yellow Page attorney has their call docket, they have all their people that they're suing for not paying on Yellow Page ads that didn't go well. Right. Yeah. And I think there are a whole lot of these website vendors that we all deal with that also want long term commitments. And it's because often their stuff doesn't work over the long term. If it was going to work, they wouldn't need a commitment because you'd be thrilled to keep paying them. So you got to watch out for that. You know, one of the other big reasons to watch out on these marketing tactics is that some of them you're going to wonder if they're ethical And today, we live in a world where the ethics rules haven't necessarily kept up with the marketing tactics. The technology is changing so fast. So, you know, when you have an opportunity, for instance, to upload your clients' email addresses to Facebook so that you can remarket additional services to those clients, which I think is a really fascinating marketing tactic. But does it violate the ethics rules? You know, when you upload those email addresses, are you giving away confidential information? I haven't seen a lot of opinions addressing that, but it makes me worry. Same if you want to create a lookalike audience on Facebook. You know, there are all sorts of tactics today with the technology that make you worry about whether they're really a good idea. You want to err on the side of of being ethical, even if it's just following the spirit of the rules. Lee, I think you're exactly right. I think that the ethics rules definitely, they're old, they're out of date. I'm not sure if any state in the country has up-to-date ethics rules, but at least in Missouri, we can call the ethics hotline and get an informal opinion. I don't know if you can do that where you are. Are you in North Carolina? Is that where you are? North Carolina, yeah, North- yeah but you know what? You ask them this question, whether you can upload those email addresses to create a lookalike audience, <laughs> I'd be willing to bet you almost anything. They have no idea how to answer that. So if you push the envelope, you're going to be living on the edge. I absolutely agree. And I guess one way around that may be to get a, a waiver, some sort of marketing waiver from a client. But anything you do, it's still kind of skating on thin ice. I, I completely agree with you. These things can come back to bite you. And I'll give you one last reason to avoid a tactic today. And that is if it's expensive. We can market our practices on a small budget today. There are incredible opportunities doing things like pay-per-click advertising, building websites, producing blogs, doing what you guys are doing with podcasting. There's just no reason to invest big bucks anymore. Back in the day when we had to commit to a 12-month contract on a a, a full spread in the yellow pages and you had to pay $5,000 a month or whatever it was, that was then. Today, now, you just don't need to commit to a big budget. And so inexpensive marketing tactics can be just as effective, if not more effective. And if I'm presented with any options that just feel too expensive, I'm not convinced that today you need them. I think you can do this all on a budget and have really good results. Yeah, I was in a a marketing group, a website marketing group, and I was paying close to $1,000 a month for that. And basically, I moved it all over to a WordPress site. I was the one creating my own content. And so now I went from spending thousands of dollars a year to spending, you know, $30 a month. So it's my costs have gone way down. And you're right. In this day and age, there's so many options and so many variables that allow us to do things on a lot cheaper basis that I think you're right. Yeah, it just makes sense to go with the lower budget option and at least see how it works. You know, if it's working really well and you want to commit to something bigger, uh, go for it. But I would shy away from anybody who walks in asking you for big bucks. And you guys, I'm sure, are having this experience. It's not unusual for one of these vendors to walk into your office and not just ask for $1,000 for a website, but to want to sell you a website for thousands of dollars, and then they want to add a search engine optimization package to it and double that, and then they want to add content production to it and triple it, 
And the number very quickly becomes way, way too big. And it just doesn't need to be that way. And I think that, like you said, Lee, if you've been doing this for any amount of time, all the big names come out at you. They, Whatever it is, they charge a lot of money up front, a lot of money a month. And it just, especially for a younger attorney, it's just going to drain you. You're going to be stressed every month trying to make payroll if you have staff, paying for your office, paying for your marketing efforts. And it just can be a real drain on you. I know we're getting close. We've got about nine minutes. I don't want to take up too much of your time. So I want to go ahead and do the hack of the week, the tip of the week. And then you also have something you're going to suggest as well. So Jimmy, you want to do your hack of the week? So I'm a big Google Apps guy. I, I spend a lot of time in Google Apps, and and they've come up with I think what they view as their competitor to Evernote, which is Google Keep. So you can do screenshots, you can do tasks, you can do notes, and it's supposed to. There's a Chrome extension for it, and I've just started playing around with it. But I've never been an Evernote person, but I understand the utility of it, and I just didn't do Evernote because I spend so much time in Google. So I'm excited about Google Keep, and I'll report back on how it's working for me. Fantastic. And I have an iPhone app. I'm not sure if it's on Android yet, but it's called Chartistic. It actually allows you to easily create charts from your phone. You can use them in ads. You can use them for trial. You can use them for whatever. It'll take you minutes. All you have to have is the data. You put it in there. You plug in the numbers, and it it is really great. You can do it in minutes. I think it's a really great tool that I'm going to start using. Lee, what you got for us? Well, I am a big fan of an AI, uh, artificial intelligent personal assistant called x.ai and what it does is it provides you with an artificially intelligent bot that helps you with scheduling meetings so if i were to send you an email jim or an email tyson and say hey i want to set up a meeting over the course of the next two weeks i would simply copy my ai assistant amy at x.ai and Amy would then interact with you and schedule that meeting in accordance with a lot of rules that she had learned from me in advance. And we would have all the interaction we need to get that meeting all set. And Amy is a bot. There is no real person there. And you would likely never realize that she wasn't a real person. See, that's why we had Lee on this podcast, because that is incredible. That is a fantastic piece of advice. It sounds like something from outer space, but the guys from Arch Grants use it. And I actually scheduled an appointment with them a couple months ago. And I was absolutely scratching my head trying to figure out whether the ex-AI person was a real person or not. Yep, you really don't have any idea. I'm using all sorts of AI agents for different reasons. I'm using one at Pana.com to schedule all my travel. I travel full-time, so there's a fair amount of it. But these bots are taking over the world, and they really function just like human beings. Pretty soon they're going to be filling out immigration forms, I think. Oh, most definitely. You, it's coming. So we better be elevating our, uh, you know, adding more value all, all the time. Hey, and Lee, would you say it was Pana.com? Pana, P-A-N-A.com. Yep. All right. I'm typing it in now. Lee, it's so great to have you on the show. Where can our, <laughs> lis- where can our listeners find you? I know Divorce Discourse is where you blog. Where else can they find you? You know, the thing that I can do for the folks that are listening that I think they will find most helpful is to direct them to rosensrules.com, and they will receive 10 rules that I have laid out for turning a so-so practice into a thriving practice. These are the rules that I have derived after 30-ish years of figuring this out, and it's an email sequence that lasts for 10 days. Every day you get a new rule, and I promise you, if you execute on these 10 rules, you will see your practice grow dramatically. It works time after time. Again, the emails I get from lawyers who say to me, hey, these rules made a huge difference, just blow me away. And they they really get me energized every day. But it, it just works. It's simple stuff, but it's stuff that none of us do consistently. Lee, I want to thank you as well. It's a great set of advice. You gave us a lot of good advice. I'm actually on your website now, the 10 rules. That's great. I also want to make sure I do plug your podcast, the Divorce Discourse podcast. I listen to it and yours are much shorter than ours, which I like it. You know, it's six minutes. I think it was the last one. Some are 10 minutes, some are 15 minutes. I want to make sure people check out your podcast as well. Well, I appreciate it. It was fun to be with you guys. Thanks, Lee. Thank you, Lee. Thanks. Bye-bye. Have a good one. Thanks for listening to the Maximum Lawyer Podcast. To stay in contact with your hosts and to access more content, Go to MaximumLawyer.com Have a great week and catch you next time.